So this is going to be our third and last video on thermodynamics. So in a previous video, we talked about the Gibbs free energy change. It's a combination combining the enthalpy change and the temperature change into one equation. And we described the free energy change as being the absolute predictor as to whether a reaction will occur spontaneously. So for a spontaneous process, um, that's where delta G is negative, right? That was our predictor for whether a reaction occurs spontaneously if delta G is negative. Delta G represents the maximum work obtainable from the system as the chemical change takes place. And for a non-spontaneous process, in other words, where delta G is positive, does not occur spontaneously, then this represents the work that we would have to put in as uh, to make the change take place. You know, one of the things, a theme that sort of resurfaced uh, over, over chemistry, too, is that things are reversible. We talked about this all the way back at the beginning with like for, for phase changes. You know, if a reaction, well, one, if a reaction, if you get a certain amount of energy, free energy out of a reaction when it goes one way, let's say, just like a phase change, then if you reverse the reaction, then that becomes the energy that you would have to put in to cause the reaction to occur. Now, one of the things about um, free energy is that we can, it's very useful because we can relate it to, to uh, phase changes. We can ultimately, we can calculate the days, we can calculate the temperature where a phase change takes place, okay? So free energy is zero during any phase change if we're at the temperature where the phase change normally occurs, all right? So the free energy is zero. So there's still an enthalpy change and there's an entropy change, but there's no free energy change, okay? So this is a calculation we did in a previous video. If we know that delta G is zero, we can set these two terms equal to one another. We can move the T delta S to the other side, divide both sides by delta S, and now you know the temperature. Okay, we can calculate the temperature at which the phase change has taken place from the enthalpy change and the energy change. Okay, so for example, ice and water. Obviously, we know that ice freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So, if we're below zero Celsius, freezing is spontaneous. In other words, all your sample will, all your water will freeze until it's all ice. If we're above melting, if we're above zero, rather, the melting is spontaneous. So all your ice will form, will melt to form liquid water. And if we're at zero degrees Celsius, then the two are in equilibrium, and that's where there's no free energy change. Okay. So let's 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 do a calculation. Let's do a calculation, and we'll see if this works out. So we're going to do it not for but for freezing or melting, but boiling, right? So we're going to for look up some thermodynamic data. And we want to calculate the temperature change for the reaction. Um, liquid water makes gaseous water. In other words, boiling. Okay, so we, we look up we look up some entropy values. Okay, so for that of liquid water is 70 joules per Kelvin mole. For gaseous water is 188.7. And our heats of formation, okay, for liquid water is minus 285.9. For gaseous water is minus 241.8, okay. So first, let's calculate the entropy change. Remember, we've gone over this many times at this point. Remember, a change is always final minus initial or products minus reactants, right? So 188.7 
have to set it up right, otherwise your, your sign will come out wrong. So 188.7 minus 70 is 118.7 joules per Kelvin mole. Okay, now, that's a positive number, correct? Okay, because this reaction is going to higher entropy, right? We're dealing with evaporation of a liquid. Um, gases have more entropy than liquids. Okay, gases have more entropy than liquids. So, yeah, so this should be a positive number, which it is. So entropy is increasing. So we could say this would be an entropy-driven reaction. Now, we'll calculate the change in enthalpy from our change in our heats of formation. So, minus 241.8, minus 285.9, right? The, the negative times the negative becomes a positive. So, basically, minus 241.8 plus 285.9 is 44. 0.1 kilojoules per mole, which I multiplied by a thousand to convert that into joules per mole. Now, why did I do this? Because I have to be consistent with our units. Your enthalpies, enthalpies are usually in kilojoules, right, per mole, and the entropy is usually in joules per mole, okay, joules per Kelvin mole. So to be consistent with the units, I multiple converted this into joules. All right, so now we can calculate delta G, or, or rather calculate T. T is delta H over delta S, so 44,100 joules per mole, divided by 118.7 joules per Kelvin mole, right? And the joules are going to cancel and the moles are going to cancel, and, and what are we left with? Kelvin, right? The Kelvins are on the bottom, but we're dividing, but that's basically 1 over, so it's 1 over the 1 over Kelvin, which comes out to be Kelvin. So, this comes out to be 371.5. Subtract 273 from it to convert it into Celsius and you have 98.5. So why doesn't this come out to be 100 exactly? Because we know water boils at 100. And that's because we're using, because this reaction happens at 100 Celsius, or, or 273 Kelvin, 373 Kelvin rather. But these are standard values, which are not, were not measured at 100 Celsius. And entropy depends on temperature. As you increase temperature, you increase entropy. So that's why it doesn't come out exactly. To get an exact number, we would have to have entropy values measured at 100 Celsius. But 98.5 is fairly close. Now, <clears throat> something else we can do with the free energy change is calculate the equilibrium constant for a reaction. And I want to first compare um, equilibrium constant to free energy change. Okay, so previously we talked about how you can use how you can use Q and K to predict the direction of a reaction. Where Q is the reaction quotient, that's what you get from plugging in actual concentrations, and K is the equilibrium constant for the reaction. So you have three cases. If Q is less than K, that means the reaction is going to shift to the right. Okay. If Q is bigger than K, that means the reaction is going to shift to the left, and if Q is equal to K, then the reaction has reached equilibrium. In other words, it is at equilibrium. So, in an analogous fashion, we've already talked about how we can use delta G to predict the direction of a reaction, correct? We said if delta G is negative, the reaction will occur spontaneously. If it's not negative, it will not, right? So, if, if delta G is less than zero, then 
the reaction will proceed, reaction proceeds to the right. That's spontaneous. Delta G has to be less than zero. If delta G is bigger than zero, then the reaction proceeds to the left. And if delta G is equal to zero, then the reaction is at equilibrium. So delta G equals zero would correspond to, you know, Q equals K. System is at equilibrium. So we can actually calculate the equilibrium constant from the free energy change using this reaction. The delta G is equal to negative RT ln K. Um, so like I said, we can calculate the equilibrium constant or reaction from the free energy change. So let's look at this reaction. Nitrogen plus hydrogen makes ammonia. This is the, basically, this is the Haber process for the production of ammonia, where these gases are reacted under pressure. And the free energy change is negative 33,300 joules. Okay. So if we take this and rearrange it for L and K, that would be delta G over RT. So negative of negative 33,000, that's right, that's going to make that positive, divided by 8.314, divided by 298, and you get 13.4. So your equation comes out to L and K is equal to 13.4. Now, how do we solve this? You've had to do something very much like this before. As long as you remember, that you can do anything to an algebraic equation as long as you do the same thing to both sides. You can add something to both sides. You can subtract from both sides. You can multiply both sides. You can divide both sides. You can take the log of both sides or the inverse log of both sides. Okay. So what we're going to do is, we've done this before, we're going to take the inverse natural log of both sides. So I'll show you how to do this. We've done this before. I'm going to show you one more time, at least on my calculator. Okay. So you could take 13.4, 13.4, and do a second function, natural log. And you get 6. No, that's not right. Let's try that again. So I got 6.6. 6. I must have carried one more digit when I did the calculation. Let's let's do it from scratch here. All right. So let's say 30. Let's say 33,000. Okay. Divided by 8.31 more. Okay. Divided by 298. Okay, so actually 13.44, but um, that's correct for significant figures because there's only three here. So let's do our second natural log of that. Yeah, and you get 6.87 times 10 to the fifth. Now notice, that's the same thing as taking e to that power. So another way you could do that would be to take 2.718 to the 13.4 hour power and you get the same answer. Okay. So, this is the same thing as basically, it's the same thing, kicking the inverse log is the same thing. So in other words, we could write this another way as saying key is it, K is equal to E to the 13.4 power it's the same thing. So I want you to note that um, that a now this is now I think we would agree we would look at this and agree that this is a big number. When you have something to the fifth power, it's a big number. This is a negative number, a large negative number, and this is a large positive number, right? So I want you to note 
that a negative, a, a negative delta G equates to a positive equilibrium constant. And a large negative delta G equates to a large positive equilibrium constant. So we're tying together these two measures of predicting these two measures of predicting whether a reaction will occur spontaneously. Okay. Now we've got one more page here. And what if we wanted to calculate the free energy change under non-equilibrium conditions? Okay. What we did in the previous problem was solve it for equilibrium conditions. In other words, delta G is zero. What if delta G is not zero? Then we would have to calculate the free energy change for the, for the non-standard non conditions from this equation. So that this, this free energy change is equal to the standard free energy change plus RT ln Q. Okay, and Q is the Q is what we would get by actually plugging in actual concentration data into the equilibrium expression. So what would be so let's ask this question. What would be the free energy change when the pressure of nitrogen is one atmosphere? That of hydrogen is three atmospheres, and that of ammonia is half an atmosphere, right? So if we so we write our reaction. Remember, our reaction was this. Hydrogen and nitrogen react to form ammonia. We'd have to, to, to balance it. We'd have to set it up this way. All right, so your mass, your equilibrium expression is concentration of ammonia, or in this case, pressure, squared, divided by that of hydrogen, cubed, divided by that of nitrogen squared. So 0.5 squared divided by 3 squared divided by or I'm sorry, 3 cubed, so 0.5 squared divided by 3 cubed divided by 1 is 0 0.0093. So Q is less than K. We figured out what K was in the, in the previous problem, 6.87 times 10 to the fifth. So clearly Q is less than K. So the reaction will shift to the right. But how would we calculate how would we calculate the free energy change under these conditions? So negative 33,300, that's the standard free energy change, plus 8.314 times 298 times ln Q, which is the natural log of the 0 0.0093. Okay, so you work this out and it comes out to be negative 44,895. Okay, so the reaction is actually, so the reaction is actually more favorable under these conditions because delta G is more negative. Okay, and so basically then a reaction is going to shift to the right makes delta G makes delta G more negative. So that's it for thermo thermodynamics and we'll stop here.